into some early detection species. We're going to talk about two early detection species, then we're going to talk about some more common species. Now, if you remember that invasion curve early detection are the ones that have either not gotten here or they're here in such um, small numbers that we think that we can still eradicate them. So I'm going to talk about two of those, and one is mile a minute. Um, that's Persicaria perfoliata. Um, mile a minute um, kind of grows a mile a minute, not quite. It grows six inches a day. Uh, so it can easily outgrow any of the native species that we have. Uh, you can identify it by its alternate simple sharply triangular leaves. Uh, they're light green and six centimeters up to 10 centimeters, six centimeters long up to 10 centimeters wide. Um, they're very narrow vines and they have these recurved spines so they'll climb up over shrubs. Uh, they are, they have this distinctive uh, circular leaf called a ochre um, that is, you can see right here there's one that wraps around the stem. There are other native or there are native species that are look-alikes that have these triangular leaves, but that is diagnostic of the species. And also diagnostic is that the, the white flowers turn into these bright blue berries. Now, it's native to Asia, um, but we have one population of myelomana in the crisp region along the Delaware and Coshecton, which is north of Narrowsburg. So we're trying to address it there um, through mostly hand pulling, but also some herbicide treatments working with the local landowners in that neighborhood. The next species that I wanted to touch on is uh, Himalayan balsam, Impatiens glandulifera. Uh, it's native to the Himalayas. It, was, it has this beautiful flower. I'll show you the flower in the next slide. Uh, it was intentionally introduced as a landscape or nursery plant uh, in the United States and in Great Britain. It likes to grow in these re riparian environments and we have several populations of it within the crisp region, uh, including out here along the Beaver Kill, uh, up uh, near Lanesville, there's a population, and then there's several others uh, in Sullivan, Sullivan County. You can identify this plant. It has these uh, lance-shaped leaves that are two to nine inches long. They're a soft green color, but most striking is the pink flowers of this plant, and it's going to flower at the, the end of the summer, so in August or early September you might see the flowers. It grows in the same environments as our, our native uh, Impatiens capensis, the common jewel weed or spotted jewel weed, the touch-me-not that you touch that will spring those seeds out. This one does the same thing, so when it's growing over a stream, those seeds can be propelled into your stream and then washed downstream and it can spread that way. It grows really densely and it can outcompete native species. Moving on to a forest pest that we have, Hemlock woolly adelgid. Uh, it has these white cottony masses uh, where it lays its eggs and develops its larvae inside these cottony masses. Are all of you familiar with, with hemlock woolly adelgid? Okay. Um, it's, has these, it's a very small insect, uh, aphid-like insect, has this crawler face that can crawl up onto birds' legs and be transported. Uh, it can be moved by wind or it can move from tree to tree. It moves really slowly. Um, it was first detected in Virginia in 1951, and now it's found in 17 states. What it does is it feeds on the xylem of the tree. Uh, it uh, drills its mouth parts into the, the twigs at the base of the needle, and eventually the foliage dies, uh, and because the tree is, is trying to close that off um, and, and treats that as a wound, so it kind of, uh, just closes those twigs off and then the, the 
branchlets will die, the needles will, be, um, will fall from the tree. There's mortality usually within 4 to 20 years. Uh, it, it, it's a slow mortality that may be slowed by cold winters, uh, but it's inevitable. Eventually the trees are going to die. And these hemlock woolly adelgid populations grow quickly, and there's no resistance within the eastern hemlock, which is our native species. The eastern hemlock range is shown in dark green here. Uh, the Carolina hemlock, which is a closely uh, related hemlock, grows in the southern Appalachians. Its range is shown in, in uh, lavender here. The cross-hashed area is the area that's infected by hemlock woolly adelgid. So you can see that HWA has covered about half of the range of the eastern hemlock in the eastern United States. And why is this important? There's no other tree that we have here in the Catskills, or in New York State for that matter, that grows the same, that has the same structure as the eastern hemlock. So if we lose it, we lose that structure, and it jeopardizes a lot of the species that depend on that tree to, to survive. It's really important wildlife habitat. It, these trees help to regulate water flow throughout the year. They help cool the water in streams and lakes. Uh, they make the water more suitable for trout. You'll have three times more brook trout in streams where you have a lot of hemlock trees uh, along the stream. They're aesthetically valuable as a beautiful part of the Catskills, or one of the things that helped to make the Catskills and the Adirondacks beautiful. Uh, and some hemlock forests are old growth. There are some trees that are over 500 years old. And Michael Kudish has identified 31 old growth stands in New York State. And we're mapping them on GIS, and we want to protect those. When hemlocks die, it opens up an opportunity for other invasive species. And with a lot of these invasive species, you get these cascading effects uh, of one invasive changing the environment and making it easier for other invasive species to move in. Moving on to the next invasive species, one that's dear to Patty's heart, and I know dear to a lot of yours, is, uh, or maybe the bane of, of yours, is uh, Japanese knotweed. And this is what it looks like right now. It's just starting to come up, kind of looks like asparagus, but uh, has these really thick stems. The leaves are starting to come out. Um, it has these purple spots on the stems of it, and that helps you to recognize what it is. Again, the purple stems, if you cut them open, then you'll see that they're hollow, uh, but they're also segmented. There is these segments across the, um, when, you, when you cut it in cross-section, you can see it. It does look like bamboo to some degree, uh, but the leaves in bamboo are, are really lance-shaped versus uh, in Japanese knotweed. They're more heart-shaped. Uh, there is some variability. There's variability in the size, uh, in the shape, but uh, it has these zig zigzaggy stems that you want to look for. Uh, it flowers the end of the summer, early fall, and you'll see these uh, big areas of the beaver kill out in the, the western Catskills or even along the Esopus. Uh, you'll see these big, dense populations of Japanese knotweed. Uh, and as Patty was saying, it really seemed to spread after uh, Hurricane Irene, Tropical Storm Lee. And what it does is it, as you break pieces off of it, each of those pieces can reestablish, reroot itself. So if you have a big flooding event during the summer or late summer, uh, as it breaks apart, then each of those pieces is washed downstream and can establish itself on the bare soil uh, from the flooding events. And it makes streams more susceptible um, to washing out. Uh, it makes more uh, or less stable uh, stream banks. As you can see from this picture, these are, this is the root structure of native plants. Uh, when streams start to wash out, 
stream banks are really uh, resistant to uh, erosion if there's a lot of native plants that are there. But Japanese knotweed has these, these big, thick rhizomes, and it doesn't hold the soil the same way. And then each of these little rhizomes, as I said, as it breaks apart, then those can reestablish themselves downstream. So it can outgrow the native species and shade them out, and then it makes the stream banks less stable over time. So it's really important uh, that if we can control that in some areas and we, we can identify where those areas are, that we try to do that and to protect some of the, the, the headwaters that we have in the Catskills. So what can you do about it? I think it's really important that uh, you learn about what invasive species are out there and which ones are most important and what you can do about them. And one thing that you can do about them if you can identify invasive species is that if you come to one of our trainings or one offered by any of the prisms around New York State, uh, there's this program called IMAP Invasives uh, where you can report in a online database the invasive species that you see. And you can either do it on your PC or you can take your smartphone out in the field and you can take a picture of something. You can upload it into this database an expert will look at it, verify that it was what you think it was, and then that gets entered into the database as a dot. So looking at hemlock woolly adelgid again here, uh, what we see are these green dots are confirmed observations, and these get sent up to people um, usually at DEC in Albany or at IMAP Invasives who will Look at the picture that you took and confirm that it was what you thought it was, whether it was hemlock woolly adelgid or Japanese knotweed or whatever it was that you can, you imported, you reported. Number one, it's right in the voice though. And I know it's a hemlock woolly adelgid. I don't know why I got yellow dot at it. Yeah, so it takes, there's um, actually one of the um, hemali. Uh, I didn't have a picture because I, I don't have a smartphone. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, it takes a while. What I was going to say is some that I've reported, it takes a while for them to confirm the observations. So, <laughs> uh, so we can check on it. Maybe we can send them an email. <laughs> so maybe you could document it again, is, is take a picture and then send it in with them. Um, so, the, so the importance of this is that it's not just you guys reporting it, but it's also that this is what I use to look at, well, what are the things that I should be working on? What are the things that are so abundant that I can't do anything about versus things that are just moving into an area? It helps us to strategize what's out there, what's around us, helps us to, to really understand where we are along that invasion curve. So you can um, go to the website, um, imapinvasives.org. You can find out about trainings. Uh, I'll show you the trainings that, that we have uh, here in the CRISP region. And what we really need are people that are able to identify invasive species and monitor them, help us to monitor them. Mm -hmm.